numbers, uh, the numbers denote the uh, uh, robot IDs. And then uh, as you can see in one node, there are five robots. In another node, there are three. And then the last one, there is single robot. So what do we want to do is that we start from that configuration, which is initial. And then we want to go to a configuration that is on the right. So there is at most a robot on a node. So uh, so starting from the initial configuration, we want to go to the, uh, the final configuration on the right. So this is a dispersion. Um, So um, this problem has some other related applications. For example, scattering is another problem that has been studied in the context of distributed robotics. Particularly there in the graph, you want to scatter, you know, uh, satisfying some uh, particular, um, uh, you know, precondition. For example, if you want to, uh, uh, in the context of grid, you want to put these robots in, you know, maintaining certain distances between uh, uh, neighbors. Okay, so that is a scattering. So uh, this one does not, uh, so this person does not worry about that distance. It just worries about just putting robots in different nodes. Similarly, exploration, load balancing. So here the load is balanced because um, from any arbitrary load in different nodes, you want to reach to a configuration where uh, you have at most a robot in, in a node. So, uh, so somehow it has you know, some relevance to load balancing, similarly covering. So basically you are distributing these robots from some nodes to many, many nodes. So it, it somehow covers if you want to look into the sensor network scenario. Similarly, self-deployment maybe starting from some position, all of them, they try to deploy in the context of, let's suppose if you have Voronoi diagram or something, then uh, that also uh, comes into picture. Another problem is relocating the self-driven electric cars to find pre or empty recharge station. So basically you have to look into whether uh, the charging station is free and then uh, just uh, try to uh, move there. So what is the objective here? What we want to do is that we want to understand how these resource limited robots accomplish dispersion in a distributed manner. So basically these robots are autonomous. They will work on their own. Uh, they will collect some information and then uh, we try to see how could they uh, solve dispersion. And then uh, we are talking about resource limited. That means we give robots some memory uh, so they will have some limited memory at each robot. And then uh, we want to study the trade-off between the time. So how long um, uh, do they take to achieve dispersion? And then what is the amount of memory that is needed at uh, each robot? So uh, let's uh, talk about the graph model first and then also the robot model. So the robots have unique IDs. So these IDs are picked somehow from one up to uh, you know, some, some constant factor of K. So, uh, so we assume that we have K robots and then the K is uh, less than or equal to N and is the number of nodes in the graph. Uh, robots have memory. So uh, they have, although we want to minimize how much memory they need, um, we have lower and upper bounds. So um, lower bounds are pretty uh, trivial. For example, log K would be the lower bound because they have K uh, different robots with different IDs. Um, so here, one more assumption that is there is, for example, if a robot leaves U, the node U and goes to node V, then it knows that with port of that V that it used to enter that node V. So that information is needed because um, from V, when that robot wants to leave V to go to some other neighbor, then uh, somehow it needs to avoid going back from the same port. So, that is the uh, assumption that is used. Um, the graph is anonymous. So basically the nodes do not have identifiers. So uh, nodes are indistinguishable, uh, but the ports at each node, they are labeled. The labels are unique. And then these labels go from one to the degree of that node. And then there is no correlation between how these port numbers are assigned. The only uh, you know, assumption that we have is that these port numbers are unique. Uh, so the graph is connected. 
the graph is undirected. So basically one no one ace can be traversed in both directions and then it's unweighted. So, uh, you know, when you leave a node then you could reach to another one in, you know, just, just one move. Uh, so we do not take into account the weight of these edges. And then these graph nodes do not have memory. So we do not uh, consider that they could store any uh, information there. So information can be stored in each robot. And then uh, you know, that's it, that's the, that's the memory that is available. If, if a robot is at a node, then that robot could store some information. But if the robot is not at a node, then there is no way to put any information there in that node. So uh, we have to also talk about some uh, communication model between these robots. For example, here we have a pretty standard notion of communication that is local. So the local communication means if two or more robots are at a node, then they could communicate with each other. For example, uh, the node where four, six, and nine, the robots are, they could communicate with each other to somehow make a decision on what to do, okay? So for example, if four uh, leaves there, uh, leaves that node to go to some other node, then it could tell six and nine, hey, this is what I did. <clears throat> um, so that is local. And then if, if uh, you are not in the same node, then you cannot communicate and then that, that condition satisfies in every round of the algorithm. The global communication means that it doesn't matter where the robots are, they could communicate, for example, four, the robot with ID four could communicate with robot with ID one, although that is not at the same node, or two, you know, they could communicate with each other. So the, even in these both models, the graph structure is not known. For example, in the global model as well, all the robots could communicate, they do not know for example, which edge to traverse to reach to that other uh, robot that is at some different node. So basically they do not know the structure of the graph. So the time model too. Uh, so we have pretty, uh, you know, uh, standard synchronous model where every robot will perform, uh, you know, a cycle in every round. So a cycle is, communicate, so collect information, communicate with other robots, depending on whether you are using local communication model or global, compute, so which port to use to exit and what to store in the memory. So the computation, that is the computation that the robot does, every robot and move is you'll update the information, what to keep in the robot at that node. And then when you leave, which port that you use to leave that node to go to some other node. So a synchronous model, we do not assume any synchrony there. So uh, uh, I'm talking about a synchronous here because we will uh, also have the bound with the asynchronous model that is uh, somehow more uh, to the literature where they focus particularly on the synchronous model. So runtime, we measure in number of rounds in the synchronous setting and then number of epochs in the asynchronous setting. Epochs is particularly the duration of time where each robot will do one cycle in you know in one complete cycle. So uh, we we count as a duration for all the robots to do at least one cycle, and then that counts as epoch. And then the memory is number of bits stored at each robot. So with that, we could go to look into what is the existing result here under local communication. There is a series of work um, and then we have different bounds. For example, if you go into memory, we have K log delta order M. Uh, and then if you have just log delta or log K, then you will have M times N certain, certain kind of bounds. For example, in ICTC 19, you could see log max K delta and then order M times L. So that L is the number of multiplicity nodes in the initial configuration. So in initial configuration, there are some nodes with only a single robot, some nodes which have no robot and some nodes which have more than one robot. And then so the L, may, the L counts how many different those uh, nodes are with multiple robots. So the uh, particularly we will compare our result with uh, algo sensors 19 and SSS 20 results where the time bounds are minimum of M comma K delta times log of L, the number of multiplicity nodes. And then the algo sensors, so that bound is established 
assuming that MK and Delta are known to the robots. So the global parameters are known to the robot. And then SSS20, that restriction was lifted. So basically the bound can be established without knowing those parameters. And then even in memory, um, in Alco sensors, order log n was proved. And then in SSS20, it's log max k delta. Actually, it matches the lower bound of log max k delta in terms of memory bits. And then if you look into the time lower bound, then this is uh, delta times log L factor away from the uh, lower bound that is known. Similarly, we have uh, per global communication. Um, you could see here in global communication, you have again, the lower bound applies uh, is in local communication. In global, there are certain results, for example, log max k delta, order min m k delta. That is, uh, you know, when you could, when the robots in all the nodes could communicate, then you can establish the bound. So the, the first result after the lower bound that I'm talking. So that is the DFS result. In BFS, you have results based on diameter and then the degree. You, you could see there. And then so the uh, the result with a star is for the single source where all robots started as same node and then other one is for the general case. So uh, in this paper, what we did is that we studied dispersion using local communication. In local communication, what we tried to do is somehow try to remove the log factor. That's what you see here. Uh, so, we can compare this result with AlgoSensors 19 and SSS20, particularly SSS20, because it does not assume anything about whether the global parameters are known or not. So basically we remove this log and factor, and then so memory is optimal, and then time is minimum of m comma k delta. And then if you see here, you can uh, make certain, uh, certain you know, uh, the observations in this result. First of all, this result, works for synchronous as well as a synchronous model. So we prove uh, for both the settings. Um, and then this bound, the time bound particularly, it matches the single source, the DFS bound. For example, if you uh, start with the configuration where all K robots are in the node, and then when you run DFS algorithm, then that DFS algorithm finishes in min M K delta rounds. So basically we match that. And then also we mask the bound in global communication model. For example, if you run the DFS algorithm in global communication model, then, then in the previous result, what uh, uh, I showed is uh, you can have order min m comma k delta with uh, memory log max k delta. So basically what, we, uh, what this result shows is that actually the bound can be obtained in the local model as well. Uh, so uh, not just the global model. Uh, so uh, so we have to talk about the known techniques before uh, before uh, you know I talk about the ideas uh, uh, that we developed in this paper. So for example, the technique is to run DFS traversal. When you run DFS traversal, then what you do is that every new node that you visit, which is free, then you put a robot on it, okay? And then and then you continue that way. And then and then when you place a robot, then you have a sense of somehow putting some information in that node. And then later when the DFS runs in backtrack mode and then everything, then you have a way to navigate and then successfully run DFS. So in single source case, no problem. DFS finishes in uh, order in um, K delta rounds, all good. So if all K robots are on K different nodes initially, the problem is trivially solved. You don't need to do anything. So the challenging cases are intermediate cases. For example, the intermediate cases are there are some number of nodes with multiple robots on them. And then, so in that case, you have to run these DFSs in parallel from these multiplicity nodes. And then if no two DFS, no two DFS traversals meet, everything is good. You know, just the single source case applies. But if two or more DFS traversals meet, then you have to find free nodes. So how to find free nodes? That is the difficulty, right? And we want to find free nodes, uh, but we want to find them fast. So just to minimize the time bound. And then, so uh, many to retraverse, they already traverse part of the graph to find the free nodes because the tree of history is meet, they already made the DFS tree. And then when you meet and subsume some other tree, then you have to maybe retraverse the 
that that tree that has already been built by some other DFS, and then go and then find the tree nodes. So, so very trivial approach would be sequential, and then at that time you know that it would be min m comma k delta times l the number of multiplicity nodes. So in AlcoSensor 19 and SSS 20, there are smarter ways to synchronize these parallel DFSs. Okay, so you go from L to log L factor. Let me see uh, how that idea works, and then and then I will go into talk a little bit about the uh, the idea that we that we developed here. So the AlcoSensor 19 it works in log L passes. So uh, you can you can run the algorithm in these passes because uh, they are assuming that m and k and delta parameters are known to the robot. So basically, uh, in in a pass there are two stages: stage one and stage two, and then each stage runs in m k delta rounds. Okay, so in stage one, what you do is that they will run the DFS traversal, and then they form DFS trees. And then, and then when the DFS tree meets some other DFS, then in stage two, you try to gather these unsettled robots to a node in that component. So this component is formed because different DFS traversals, traversals meet. And then when you consider the meeting of these DFS traversals, then you, you can say that that is a connected component of these traversals. So the challenge is, what to do when two DFS trees meet. So uh, you have to say that, okay, one will prevail and other is going to be subsumed, then how do you do it, right? And then stage two is, okay, when many, many DFSs meet and then how do you start the collection process, right? Which node will start the collection process? Because if you want to pick a node to start a collection process, then you may need to have some global information and that is not known, but what you do is that on the fly, you will be able to, you will, you will try to uh, find a node which eventually collects. Okay, so what they showed is that after each pass, number of multiplicity nodes decrease by at least half. So you know that when the number of multiplicity nodes decrease by half, then in local passes, then the algorithm will solve the problem. So, um, Okay, so the, the challenge in stage one is uh, handled by, let's suppose if you have two DFS traversals that meet, then the higher, higher ID DFS traversal continues and lower ID stops. Okay, so, uh, so th that ID is known to every node in that DFS, and then so you could make that decision. In challenge, uh, in stage two, how do you solve it is, when a, when a DFS traversal meets and then it has unsettled robots, it will immediately switch into stage two and then tries to go and collect. And then, so the collection happens in how many unsettled robots that you have. And then when you go and then try to collect, if you have the largest number of unsettled robots in all the DFS trees that met in that component, then you will prevail. Otherwise you will subsume to some other. And then eventually there is a, there is a single DFS that collects and then that collection and set a node. And then that's how um, they solve the problem. So what is the, uh, the limitation of this approach? The limitation is that the pairwise subsumption and collection of unsettled robots that might happen in this situation. And then when the DFS in later passes, when it traverses the graph to find the free nodes, then the situation happens that you have to retraverse the already traverse part of the graph many, many times because the uh, DFS tree that is built by different DFS traversals, they are all they are there. You just collected the unsettled ones, but the built part of the tree you haven't touched. And then so when you need to retraverse the part, then this log L factor seems cannot be removed using this this approach. So we need some uh, new idea here on how to do it, right? So what we do is that now, the new idea that we developed in this paper is, we want to run subsumption based on the size of the DFS trees, not just IDs of the DFS trees. Now we want to look into, okay, how big is the tree? And then, uh, so we uh, give ID to that DFS based on size and DFS ID. So DFS ID we take as in the algo sensors or SSS paper, and then we also have the size. The challenge is that if you look into this one, the size is known 
only to the head node of that DFS traversal, okay? So uh, because size increases when the head traverses and then finds free nodes, right? So, so the size is not known to all the nodes that are, that are part of that DFS. So, uh, so the, the challenge is how to find the size, okay? So we will we'll, uh, see that how we do it. But when you have size in DFS, now you compare these ideas in lexicographical order and then the, particularly what we do is that the higher size DFS subsumes a smaller size DFS. And then when you ask higher size DFS to subsume a smaller size DFS, then you know that the subsumed part of the traversal can be computed or the subsumption can be done in, in the cost proportional to the size of the traversal that is subsumed. And you know that that cost is no more than the cost of the DFS that is subsumed because bigger size one is subsuming the smaller size. So that way we could control the cost. And then one more thing what we do is that if you subsume another DFS traversal, then we collapse the DFS tree. We do not leave the DFS tree there. So in the previous one, what they, what they did is that they did not collapse the DFS tree. They just collected the unsettled <clears throat> robots from uh, th those DFS trees, and then they try to find other nodes. Here, we just collapse that DFS tree, we collect all these robots, and then we, we, uh, we bring those robots to the head of the DFS that subsumes the other one, and then now it extends the DFS traversal from its head node. So that way, when, when the DFS, uh, you know, DFS builds its tree, and then it is the one that is subsuming, then no one else is going to, uh, you know, do anything with this. So basically the, uh, the, uh, the built part of the DFS is not going to be, uh, you know, you are not going to re again. And then which is the benefiting factor to remove the log L bound. So why this idea works, for example, collapse and merge can be done in time proportional to the size of the subsum traversal. And then the subsum traversal is always ease of size is smaller than the subsuming one. So that, that way we have just the constant factor increase in the cost based on uh, for the, for the subsumption. And collapse and merge also obvious the need to visit the nodes of the subsum traversal because when you collapse, then that tree is not there at all. You collected the robots and then for the collection, you spend the cost that is smaller than the cost that you needed to build the tree uh, the, the, subsumed, uh, the subsuming traversal, okay? So, uh, and then also one traversal always remains subsuming because, uh, because there has to be one traversal that always grows, okay? It grows bigger and bigger, and then the other, one, other ones are smaller and smaller. So that, that we call it master. So, um, so this is the high level on how it works, but is it that simple? So uh, uh, there is a challenge. The challenge is, particularly two, how to execute size-based subsumption. As I mentioned before, the size is only known to the head node. So when a DFS uh, goes and meets another DFS, then it cannot immediately tell whether I am subsuming to that DFS or I'm subsuming that DFS, right? So basically you have to go to the head and then so you have to traverse the met DFS traversal to go to its head to find its size. And then if we, do not do carefully, then there will be a situation of deadlock because not just pairwise meeting happening, there might be transitive chain and then the meeting graph is always evolving. So um, there is a problem. And then what we do is that we uh, on the fly, parties in the meeting graph, so it doesn't matter what kind of meeting graph that happens. So on the fly partisan, partisaning we do. So this partisaning, you do not need to know anything about it. So uh, when you go and find the size, you try to go and then subsume some of the other DFS traversals. And then when you go and subsume, you know that, okay, this part is going to be subsumed. And then the other parts are going to be waiting there because, because you are visiting the other part of the graph to go to the head node and then there is a path and then in that path if some other one comes then they already know that someone is going and working on subsuming the dfs so they will synchronize on um, that part so uh, particularly it the effect will be the partitioning of the meeting graph and then so we can remove the deadlock there 
So that's it. So the analysis would be, so all the DFS drivers started the first round because initial configuration is given to us and then they started the same round. And there is a master DFS traversal that has never been subsumed. It always uh, goes and subsumes other traversals, but it never gets subsumed. And then the, that meeting graph, when it evolves, it goes from the uh, you know the bottom level to the uh, root level, and then where these meeting graphs just become the uh, you know just just the meeting of these traversals becomes the node of the uh, tree. So the master traversal alternates between growing. So master traversal grows, it subsumes other partitions and grows again. So it continues that way. So this growing and then subsuming happens in intervals. So uh, what, we can, uh, what we can prove is that the subsumes and the total number of subsumptions doesn't matter how many of them, it finishes in min m k delta time. And then the growing part also finishes in min m k delta time because the master traversal is uh, you know, uh, somehow behaving like the single source traversal where all the nodes start from the same node. So here, uh, the master traversal it starts growing and then subsumes some more and then it starts growing and subsumes some more and it starts growing. So eventually there is a waiting time and then growing time. So that totally uh, we, can, we can bound that time into uh, order of min m k delta. And for the number of bits, log delta bits are enough to collapse, retrace and merge a DFS tree. So we, we prove that we just need log delta bits. Log k bits are needed to, needed to run DFSs, differentiating DFS IDs and some other bookkeeping information that is needed to synchronize this uh, meeting and partitioning of this traversal. So total time would be order min m k delta and total memory would be order log k plus delta bits per robot. So in asynchronous case, how do we solve it? Is that uh, when a robot leaves a node, then it also identifies how many other co-located robots they should be moving with it to uh, the node it is going. So, uh, so uh, and, then, and then when it goes to other node V, it does not leave V until those robots that it computed to come to that node have not arrived to node V. And then when you do the synchronization, and then essentially the asynchronous case could fall to synchronous. And then the synchronous algorithm, as I described before, uh, works for the asynchronous case as well. And then the time in memory bound, they stay the same. Uh, so to conclude, this is the first algorithm that removes order log L factor from the best probability known results. It matches single source DFS bounds because in single source DFS bounds too, order mean MK delta is the time if you run DFS algorithm. So time and memory is optimal. They are actually simultaneously optimal for constant degree graphs. For example, if you have delta order one, then uh, the, the time bound becomes order K and then the memory bound becomes order log K. And then those are the lower bounds that we know. So future work would be to improve either the lower bound to min MK delta or upper bound on time, which have which, which we have order min MK delta to order K that matches the lower bound. So this is either to improve the lower bound or improve the upper bound to mass the uh, lower bound. So um, that's all. Um, thank you so much for listening. And then if you have any questions, I will take them now. Thank you. Okay. okay, so the second paper of the session is about asynchronous gathering methods from any sandwich in the book. Yeah. So first of all, hello uh, everyone. I'm Annie Salamani from the University of Strasbourg. I'm going to present a joint work with Sayaka Kamei, Kohito Oshita, Sebastian Tixai, and Koichi Wada about the asynchronous gathering uh, on the terrace. So just uh, to say for those who are not familiar with this area, Basically, we have a collection of mobile entities that we call robots. And what we try to do is to make the robot collaborate in order to solve a given task. But we don't want to have expensive, intelligent robots. Instead, we want to create a kind of collective intelligence starting from really weak and basic robots. So most of the time, what we try to do is to figure out what are the minimum hypotheses in order to solve a given task. 
So if we look back uh, to the title, we have robots that involve in a torus shaped network. They have to solve the gathering problem in the asynchronous setting. So let me explain all these and let me start by talking about the assumptions that we have on the robots. So we assume that the robots are autonomous, which means that there is no central authority that tells the robot what to do. They are identical, so we cannot distinguish them. For example, using their appearance, they don't have any IDs and they all execute the same algorithm. Uh, they are mobile, so they move and they cannot remember past actions. So they are oblivious. So when rob when, uh, a robot moves from one position to another position, in the new position, it cannot remember it per, uh, where it, can, it came from. And one uh, specificity for this model is that the robot cannot interact directly by exchanging messages, but they have sensors that allow them to see the position of the other robots. So the robots operate in the well-known uh, loop, compute, and move cycle. So, cycles. so for example, uh, they start by taking a snapshot uh, during the first uh, phase. And then according to the snapshot, they compute a neighboring destination or they decide not to move. And in the last phase, they just move to the computed destination, if any. So there are different synchrony uh, level. Actually, it's synchrony level, not a synchrony level. So uh, we have the fully synchronous model in which at each time instant, all robots are activated and they execute in the synchronous manner their cycles. So they look together at the same time, they compute a destination and move at the same time. That is the semi-synchronous model, so which is similar to the fully synchronous model, except that uh, a subset of robots is activated and the robots that are activated execute their cycle in a synchronous manner. And we have the asynchronous model, which is the more realistic one, in which basically the time between the loop compute and move uh, phase is finite, but not bounded, which means that we can have a robot uh, that takes a snapshot, but when it decides to move, it moves according, I mean, uh, so all the robots may have moved already. So we say in this case that the robot is out outdated because it has an outdated view and it has moved according to this outdated view. So in our setting, well, I mean, in our case, we consider the, the asynchronous setting in which uh, the time is finite, but not bounded. All right, so as I said, the robot evolved in a torus shaped network. So the torus can be seen as a grid. Uh, such that the left side is connected to the right side and the bottom side is connected to the upper side. And we assume here that there is no labels uh, on the node, so nodes have no IDs, and we don't have any orientation, which means that if there is a robot on one node, it cannot make a difference between the left, the right, the upper uh, direction, and the bottom direction. The only thing that we, uh, we, we consider is that uh, the torus is not uh, square, which means that the number of rings on one side is different from the number of rings on the other side. So we can distinguish each of these rings. So some of them, we call them small L rings and the other, we call them big L rings, depending on the number of nodes on the, L, uh, on the ring. So if we look at the state of each node, Basically, it can either be empty, which means that it doesn't host any robot. It can be occupied, and in that case, it can host a single robot, or it can host also a, a, a several robots. In this case, we would say that there is a multiplicity or a tower on this node. So there are different models depending on whether the robots are able to distinguish between nodes that host a single robot from those uh, that hosts more than one robot. So this is what we call multiplicity detection. So we will say that, that the robot have no multiplicity detection if they cannot make the difference. So for them, a node that uh, hosts a single robot is exactly the same as a node that hosts more than one robot. It just occupied. There is the local multiplicity detection, which means that I can the robot can sense the multiplicity if it is part of it. So only on its current node. And that is the last ca case, which is the global uh, multiplicity detection, which means that a robot can send the multiplicity on any node uh, on the graph. 
And then if they can sense, I mean, uh, they can sense the multiplicity, there are also two cases. So they can know exactly how many uh, robots are part of the multiplicity. And in this case, we will say that we have a multiplicity detection. Otherwise, they can know that there is a multiplicity, but they don't really know how many robots are part of it. So uh, if we organize uh, the, um, the assumptions from the weakest assumption to the strongest assumption, basically, I mean, obviously, if they don't have a multiplicity detection is the weakest assumption that we can have. And if they have a global strong multiplicity detection, then it's the strongest uh, assumption that we have. In our case, we consider local weak multiplicity detection, which means that a robot can sense the multiplicity if it is part of it. And if it says the multiplicity, it cannot count the number of robots that are on the same node. Um, so now what we mean by the gathering problem. So the idea is we start from an arbitrary configuration in which each node hosts uh, at most one robot. And the idea is to make all the robots uh, gather on a single node, which is not known in advance. Um, so, when we have, I mean, most of uh, the solutions when we have global multiplicity detection is to create a single multiplicity node that can be sensed by all the other robots. And then this multiplicity node is used as a landmark for the other robots to join and the gathering will be achieved. So since we have only local multiplicity detection, uh, this is not possible because basically even though we have a multiplicity node, for the other robot, it's just an occupied node, cannot make the difference. And uh, one challenge when we have lo local multiplicity detection is we need to prevent the system to reach this configuration, a configuration in which we have two nodes that are occupied by multiplicities. Why? Because these two multiplicities basically behave as a single robot. And we know that the gathering, here I took the case of uh, a ring is impossible to gather because they will only exchange uh, their position. And one, uh, one another challenge is uh, to deal with asynchronous, I mean, the outdated robots in the asynchronous setting. So here, for example, in this configuration, the pink robot can move. So the scheduler activates the robot. It takes a snapshot, but it's too slow, so it doesn't move. After some time, so this is at time t, after some time, some other robot might have moved. And in this configuration, the pink robot is not allowed to move anymore. But since it has an outdated view, what happens is the robot will move and we will have unwanted uh, multiplicities. So we need to prevent this kind of situations. All right, so uh, what we did, uh, the first con uh, contribution is some impossibility results. So we first uh, show that uh, the gathering problem is not possible if we have a series of, if the configuration is invariant by a series of non empty translations or a reflection on an edge axis or uh, rotations whose center of rotation doesn't have uh, a robot. So this is an adaptation from the general theorem that we find uh, in this paper. And we also show that two robots cannot gather in a torus, in a, even in a fully synchronous uh, model. And we show that if the robot do not have multiplicity detection, then the gathering is, is not possible. Which means that if I go back to this, local mean multiplicity detection is a necessary condition. We cannot do without this. Okay. On the other side, we have uh, an algorithm that, solve, uh, that solves the gathering problem uh, uh, for a number of robots which is equal or larger, larger to three, but we have some conditions on the initial configuration. So first of all, we don't consider a square torus. This is important. And the second thing is we start from rigid configuration. What I mean by rigid configuration is that we don't have any axis of symmetry which means that each robot has a unique view initially. When it takes a snapshot, they compute a unique view. All right, uh, so what we want to do is to create a kind of orientation. And from that orientation, we'll be able to elect a node for the gathering, and this node will be environed during the whole process. 
So to do so, we define a set of configurations that we call C-target configuration that have some properties. So in this configuration, we have a unique maximal ring, which means that there is no other L ring that has as many uh, robots as this ring. So it's the ring that has the maximum number of robots. And this ring has one empty L ring. Uh, uh, adjacent MTM ring and another one that is ever occupied by one, two or three. But to simplify, I just took the case in which we have a, a single uh, robot. And the idea of the algorithm is uh, if we have this configuration, then the gathering becomes easy because we have an organization uh, since the unit, we have a single unique maximal error. So the idea is to first, starting from a, an arbitrary initial configuration to reach a C-target configuration. And from a C-target configuration, we perform the gathering. So let me start by the second phase to tell you that it's easy to solve the gathering problem once we have a C-target configuration. As I said, we have an orientation and we can make all the robots on the torus move to join this node. And this can be in order starting from the closest one first. And then we, uh, the other will move one by one till everyone joins the node. Once they join the, the, the node, we only have robots on the unique maximal L ring and the, the unique occupied node that is here. And here the idea is to make the robot on the maximum L ring move to join this one, but not all of them. Only uh, up to uh, three robots. So everyone joins except three robots. And then these three robots will create a pattern. And the idea here is to gather all the robots in this node. Why? Because uh, we need to make sure that eventually, if we have two occupied nodes, then one of them is a single robot, is not a multiplicity. So the idea here is first to make all these robots move to join this node. And then we make sure that these two robots host exactly a single robot. I mean, these two nodes host a single robot. So either they move together and the gathering is achieved or the scheduler can activate one of them. But in this case, we are sure that this one is a single robot and we can break the symmetry and perform the gathering. So the idea is just to say, if we have only two occupied nodes and I'm single, I just move to my uh, neighboring adjacent node. Now, the problem is to reach such a configuration. The C-target configuration is the main challenge. So I'm not going through the details, uh, but just to give an overview. So the idea first is to decrease the number of maximal L rings. So here, for example, we have three maximum L rings and we need to reach a configuration in which we have exactly one maximal uh, L ring. So depending on whether I have an empty node or not, the strategy is a bit different. So either we create a tower, but we know how to deal with them, or we just, here we have an empty node, so we just need to move a robot, for example, this one, and fill one of the empty nodes. So by doing so, we know for sure that we reach a configuration in which we have a single max, uh, unique maximal l -ring. Uh, once we have this, we need to make one of the two adjacent L rings uh, empty. So to do so, uh, to do this, we will consider we will uh, say compare the number of robots on both sides. And for example, uh, I took the easy uh, I took the easy case in which we have different number of robots. In this case, for example, the robot on this L ring will perform the gathering. Oops. I was too fast. <laughs> so we'll perform the gathering. The problem is we cannot use uh, directly an algorithm that solves the gathering uh, on the rings because maybe the configuration of the robots here is not gatherable. We only know that the whole configuration is rigid. And actually what we did is we proposed an algorithm for this gathering that takes, that takes advantage of this uh, rigidity of the whole configuration. So eventually all the robots on this ring will gather. And here we just need to, we're not done yet. We still have two occupied adjacent L rings. And the idea is to use, uh, is similar uh, at, uh, as what I explained er uh, earlier, 
So for instance, here, uh, the robots on this L ring will move to join this node, except three of them. Why three? Because with three, it's easy to prevent the creation of towers. And by doing so, oops. And by doing so, my computer is a little bit slower and I'm too, okay. By doing so, we make the robots uh, create this pattern and then the single robot will just move to join the middle node that is shown in red. And by and this configuration is a C target configuration. All right, so um, to give an overview of the whole algorithm, so basically we have two phases. In each phase, we basically create a subset of configuration that satisfies some properties. And we show that eventually, we from, if we start from any configuration in the first phase, we reach a configuration in the second phase. And from a configuration in the second phase, basically, the, we achieve the gathering. We still have some uh, open questions. The first one is we only consider rigid configurations. We, we uh, want to define the exact set or characterize the exact, uh, exact set of configuration that are gatherable. Uh, basically what we have, if we have an axis on a node and not on an edge. And uh, we want to investigate the case of the square torus. This is the main challenge. It's kind of difficult. It was already difficult in a non square torus. So the difficulty will be to choose a side to decide on the, uh, the right air ring. And the last uh, thing to consider is what if we have myopic robot. So what we mean by myopic robot is robots that have limited visibility range. So here in our case, when the robot takes a snapshot, it sees the position of all the, rob the other robots. So what happens if we restrict the visibility range, for example, to see only the neighbors or at some distance. All right, thank you very much. Hello, I'm Artyok Dash and today I'm presenting our paper, Pattern Formation by Robots with Inaccurate Movements. This is a joint work with Kostov Bosch and Buddhadev Shau. We here consider the arbitrary pattern formation problem. <clears throat> here a pattern is given as input and a set of autonomous robots have to form the pattern without collisions. The robots operate in loop compute move cycles. Each robot is activated infinitely many times. Whenever a robot is activated, it performs three functions consecutive consecutively, loop, compute and move. In the loop phase, a robot takes a snapshot of the positions of all the robots. In the compute phase, a robot performs computations according to a deterministic algorithm to decide a destination. It uses the snapshot obtained in look phase as input. In move phase, it moves to the computed destination. The traditional model for robots in theoretical works assumes the robots to be autonomous, which means there is no centralized control, homogeneous, all the robots execute the same algorithm, Anonymous, robots have no distinct IDs and identical, robots are not distinguishable by their physical appearance. They also assume that the robots have very little or no memory to remember, to remember past actions and have no direct communication capability or some very primitive communication mechanism, for example, by externally visible lights. Majority of the existing literature adopt an accurate movement model. In this model, robots can move in any arbitrary direction with infinite precision. The robots can move by any amount, even by arbitrarily small amounts, with infinite precision. Moreover, sometimes robots are allowed to move along curved trajectories. The correctness of the algorithms in this model often heavily relies on the accurate execution of the movements. Needless to say, this is not a very realistic assumption because in practice, robot movements are prone to error. In this paper, we study the arbitrary pattern formation problem by robots with inaccurate movements. Let us now introduce our error model formally. Suppose the robot wants to move from X to Y. But due to the error, 
robot will end up somewhere near y inside this red disk in this case the maximum possible error in distance will be the radius of this disk which we denote by error sub dxy also the maximum possible error in direction will be the angle between the line xy and the tangent on the disk from s we denote this by error sub xy error sub d should increase as dxy increases and vice versa we also expect the same for the angle error but the angle error should be bounded as we don't expect a robot to make an error of say 90 degree so we want to have this kind of picture observe that when robot wants to move to y2 the maximum distance error which is equal to the radius of the disk is larger than that in case of y1 and is even larger when it goes to y3 for the angle error it is larger in case of y2 than y1 but after a certain point it stops increasing for this to happen we define error sub d and error sub a in the following manner we define error sub d to be mu times the distance so that as the distance error increase error sub d also increases and vice versa then error sub a would be sin inverse mu since we want error sub a to grow to grow with dxy in the manner we mentioned earlier we define mu xy as minimum of delta comma lambda dxy so that mu xy also increases with dxy but up to a certain constant delta we assume that the value of delta and lambda are known it is not difficult to see in this model exactly forming a pattern is not possible we call this version exact arbitrary pattern formation so we focus on the approximate version of the problem which basically means we are happy with something which resembles the target pattern to make things formal we need to define what it means for two patterns to be similar formally the objective is that the robots have to come to a configuration which is epsilon close to the input pattern f suppose the input pattern looks like an x then embed the pattern on the plane take balls of radius epsilon d at each point but d is the diameter of acc of the embedding where acc means smallest enclosing circle each robot is to be placed inside each ball so that we obtain a configuration which somehow looks like a x somewhat looks like a x however we can show that approximate arbitrary pattern formation is unsolvable if the initial configuration has rotational symmetry with no robot at the center of the acc or reflection symmetry with respect to a line with no robot on it it is known that leader relation cannot be solved from such configuration the proof is by contradiction if we can solve approximate arbitrary pattern formation from such configuration then we can also solve leader relation for this we simply ask to form a pattern with the special position for example this configuration but there is an outlier point the robots will be placed in this disk so we obtain this pattern and we can ask the outlier robot to become the leader hence leader relation can be solved and it is a contradiction so we have this impossibility result that approximate arbitrary pattern formation cannot be solved from these configurations then we show that from all other configurations the problem is solvable in oblot plus async and f com plus async model in oblot model the robots have no memory and no communication capability by semi synchronous scheduler we mean the execution happens in rounds but not all robots are active in each round in f com model the robots Uh, have a light through which they can communicate finite bits of information and 
uh, in async scheduler the scheduler is asynchronous We discuss the main difficulty of the problem in our inaccurate movement model. The ACC usually plays a crucial role in pattern formation algorithms. For example, its center is set as the origin of the agreed coordinate system with respect to which the pattern is embedded. The robots on the ACC may need to move. If the robots move along the ACC with perfect accuracy, then the ACC will remain unchanged. If the robots try to move along the circle, it may skid off due to the movement error and the agreed coordinate system may be lost. A robot may have to move onto the ACC from inside. Again, the ACC may change due to the movement errors. So we see that placing the robots at the correct positions on the ACC is a difficult issue in our model. We handle this by using some, uh, something which we call bounding structure of the target pattern. The bounding structure is simply a minimal set of points whose circumcircle is the ACC of the pattern. In the left figure, the bounding structure is the blue triangle whose circumcircle coincides with the smallest enclosing circle of the entire pattern. And the right figure, the bounding structure consists of uh, consists of these two diametrically opposite pattern points. The main idea is two or three robots will first approximate the bounding structure and fix the ACC. This ACC will be kept invariant for the rest of the algorithm. For this, we have to somehow fix the coordinate system and then embed the target pattern. Then we have the, these balls of radius epsilon d. The internal robots will approximate the pattern by moving inside these balls. While moving, it is important that they remain strictly inside the SCC so that SCC remain unchanged. We now get into more details. The algorithm works in three phases. In phase 1, we break symmetry and obtain an asymmetric configuration. Then we remove all the non-critical robots so that only critical robots remain on SEC. Here critical robots means those robots whose removal changes the SEC. Let us now describe how we break symmetry in phase 1. If there is a robot at center, we move that robot. We move the robot in such a manner that no new symmetries are created and there are no collisions. In case 2, there is no uh, robot at the center of SEC, there is unique reflection symmetry and at least one non-critical and there is at least one non-critical robot on the reflection axis. In this case, all the robots have different views and we use this to move one robot so that no new symmetries are created and there are no collisions. In case 3, there is no robot at the center of SEC, there is unique reflection symmetry there is no non-critical robot on the reflection axis and there are at least three robots on SEC. There is a unique robot on the reflection axis on the SEC. We move this robot. Notice that moving this robot changes the SEC. We have to ensure that the new configuration does not have any symmetries. But since the SEC changes, this is not easy. So the movement in this case is a bit complicated. The details of which I will speak, uh, skip. In case 4, there is no robot at the center of SEC, there is unique reflectional symmetry. Uh, there is no non-critical robot on the reflection axis, there is exactly two robots on SEC. The two robots on the reflection axis on the SEC are with different views. We move one of them. In this case also the SEC will change and, and as movement instructions are complex, I will explain the, I will not explain them in detail. Once we have an asymmetric configuration, we sequentially bring the non-critical robots inside. In phase 2, the objective is to form the bounding structure. In phase 2, we begin with only critical robots on SEC. We have three cases depending on the number of critical robots on SEC. 
and the size of the bounding structure. Case one: three critical robots on ECC and three points on the bounding structure. So the job here is to transform the triangle. The ECC will change in this case, and we have to ensure that the internal robot remain inside. I am skipping the details of movement instruction. In case two, there are two critical robots on ECC and three points on the bounding structure. In this case, we have to move one internal robot outside. In this case, also the ECC will change. Case three, three critical robots on ECC and two points on the bounding structure. In this case, we have to move one robot inside. In phase three. The internal robots will approximate the pattern. First, we have to fix the coordinate system, and then embed the pattern. The coordinate system should remain unchanged during the movement of the internal robots. We will fix the coordinate system in the following way: when there are three critical robots, we will ensure that they form a scalene triangle. This will imply that the configuration has asymmetry. We will use this asymmetry to fix the coordinate system. In case of two critical robots, we will have a unique robot closest to center that is not collinear with the critical robots. This will help to fix the coordinate system. Then we embed the pattern. Due to the asymmetry, we can pair each robot with a target point. Then the robots have to move close to its target point. For this, the robot arm must move inside the disk around T. The robot we need to approach the destination T to, through a number of small intermediate, intermediate steps in order to control movement errors. A robot should not disturb an already realized point. So the robot may have to treat the disc uh, obstacle as obstacles and avoid them in its journey to its target point. When all the target points are realized, phase three is complete, and uh, our problem of our approximate arbitrary pattern formation is solved. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I am the hybrid communication part of the robotics and hybrid communication section. Um, I'm going to be talking about near shortest path routing in hybrid communication networks. Uh, my name is Sam. I'm a PhD student at the University of Warwick. Um, this is joint work with my supervisor, Artie Chumai, as well as Michael Feldman, Christian Hinenthal, Fabian Kuhn, Christian Scheidler, Philip Schneider, and Martin Strauss. Um, so, in modern communication networks, we often have multiple modes of possible communication. Um, so, for example, in ordinary sort of desktop laptop communication networks, we have local area connections and, and WAN connections. Um, and also in mobile communication, we have short range peer to peer communication, so Bluetooth and things like this, or, or radio communication. And we have longer range um, cellular networks. And often these share a very common theme which is that uh, we have a combination of local communication, which is inexpensive and high bandwidth, but short range, or maybe more accurately, sort of topologically restricted, right? We can only communicate with certain other nodes in our network. Uh, and we have global communication, which we want to avoid using, we want to use sort of a limited amount, maybe we only can use a limited amount. Um, and sometimes it's slower as well, um, but we can communicate with everyone else. So we've got these two possible modes of communication. And I'm going to be talking about uh, a model here and a problem which uses both of these modes of communication in, in tandem, essentially. Okay. So um, assessing for this paper, we've got a set of nodes in the Euclidean plane which have unique identifiers. Um, we have as our input graph, as our underlying communication graph, we have a unit disk graph. So two nodes are connected by an edge if they're um, within a certain distance of each other, let's say one. Um, Standard assumption and distribution is confusing. With communication occurs in synchronous rounds. So in every round, um, nodes will be able to do some local computation, and then they'll be able to communicate with other nodes. Um, and the, communicate, the computation they can do um, by themselves is, say, arbitrary and unbounded. Now, as for communication, um, we're going to look at the hybrid model of communication. Um, this was introduced uh, at SODA early last year. There have been um, several different formulations of the idea of combining local and global communication, but this is the one I'm going to look at during this talk. 
Um, now, it was presented at, at SODA last year as sort of a combination of multiple parameters, of, like the amount of local communication you're allowed and the amount of global communication that you're allowed. I'll go over the parameterization that we're using during this talk over the next couple of slides. The idea is each node can use plentiful local communication, but only limited global communication. And uh, as a standard, algorithmic complexity corresponds to the number of rounds we need to solve a certain problem. Okay, so the local node, um, this is the first time it's been introduced to this conference, so I'll, I'll go over it. Um, adjacent nodes, so that's nodes that are within distance one of each other, can communicate in the local mode. And the local mode is the congest model. So nodes may send O of log n bits to each neighbor every single round. Um, now we assume that uh, node, node IDs have length approximately log n. So in practice, this is a constant number of node labels and edges, or something like that. Um, now we also say here that our, our results hold if we add a, a restrictive, but very natural in this setting uh, assumption, which is that um, the messages that every node sends to its immediate neighbors must be identical in every round. Normally in congest, we can send different messages to different neighbors. But if we assume that each node only has some sort of um, radio broadcast thing and it can't possibly send different messages to all of its neighbors, we can still perform our algorithms, uh, despite the degree of the input graph potentially being n. Um, so that's the local mode. The global mode, um, obviously the, there's a very limited amount of uh, the global mode that nodes can use, and we are going to assume the node capacitated clique for the global mode. So um, this was introduced in Spark 2019. Nodes may send O of log n messages of O of log n bits per round. Uh, they must know the ID of any nodes that send messages to, and this is again a natural assumption. It's like having the phone number of your, your recipient for a message. Um, we're going to assume an additional uh, restriction, or our algorithm works under an uh, additional restriction of uh, NCC0. Uh, so initially, nodes only know the IDs of their neighbours in the underlying graph. So you only know the contact information for nodes that you're adjacent to. Um, and you can, you, can in, you can find out the information for other nodes, but you have to, you have to learn it over time. Um, and this was introduced uh, in IBDPS last year. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the communication model. Uh, under control, what, what problems do we want to solve? So we want to compute a routing scheme. Um, and informally and briefly, a routing scheme consists of a labeling. So we're going to give every single node in our graph a label, um, which may sort of encode information about the topology of the graph. And it may sort of, um, it, it's essentially an address for a node that we uh, were allowed to use during this routing process. Uh, we also want to compute or have some way of computing locally a routing function, which goes from vertices and labels to other vertices. So what the routing function does is given the current location of a message and the label or address of the destination, it determines which neighbor to forward the message onto. So this is what we want to compute. And we want to compute it quickly and we want to keep the label small if we can. Um, so we're gonna to try to do both things. And specifically, we want the following conditions. So, um, we want a constant stretch routing scheme. So given a whole free, and I'll come back to what that restriction means in practice in a minute, uh, unit disk graph, we want to find a routing scheme which satisfies uh, four key properties. Uh, we want it to be well, correct. Obviously we want it to induce actual paths between every pair of nodes. We want it to be local. So um, nodes store some information locally and they can use that to compute this routing function row. Uh, we also need it to be efficient, so all paths only being a constant factor, hop distance, and Euclidean distance. So there are two different things here, the actual distance they travel and the number of hops they take. Uh, we want a constant factor worse than optimal for both cases. And we want nodes to only have to store a small amount of information. So in order to compute this function row, we don't want nodes to have to store, say, the whole input graph or something. We just want a small amount of information stored for each node. Okay, now, if we only have local communication, this is actually difficult. Um, and this was shown um, uh, by one of my co-authors, uh, Fabian, and um, a couple of other authors in, in 2002, um, or by arguments in that paper, it's impossible to set up a compact routing scheme with constant stretch in time little o of root n when just relying on the local edges, even if we've got something that's whole free. And I haven't put a diagram up on the slide, perhaps I should have done it nice, like, um, to think about why, so if we've got a big ring of nodes and we've got spokes coming in from the ring and we assume that the spokes are of length root n um, and that our ring is of length root n, um, 
then we don't know which spoke to travel down. If, we, if we've got a destination of, uh, at the end of a spoke, we've got no way to sort of, um, in fewer than route 10 rounds, to communicate which spoke we're, we're meant to go down if we're trying to, trying to find our target. And in fact, not only can we not get constant stretch, we can't get um, sub square root of n stretch, it turns out. Uh, so we need some global communication to solve this problem. And it turns out that we can solve this problem very well using a very limited amount of global communication. And our main result is as follows. So given a whole free unit disk graph, we can compute a compact stateless routing scheme in log n rounds of the hyperbola. The node labels that we compute are only log n bits in size, uh, and we can evaluate the routing function locally with each node storing just our log n bits. So we, we think this is about as good as, good as you can do as, as, uh, for computing compact routing schemes. Um, so I'm going to go through our algorithm, um, at least briefly, not, not too many details. Um, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to abstract away our unit disk graph because it turns out it's not a particularly useful thing to have. We're going to um, sparsify it a bit and we're going to sort of regularize its structure. So here's how we do that. So we've got our set of points in R squared which induce a unit disk graph. So um, they all have disks around them. So these disks are of radius a half. Um, so any pair of overlapping disks means that we have a pair of nodes that are connected in the UD. So we draw the graph induced by the points and, and its radio polygon. Um, now by radio polygon here, you can see that I've not shaded the middle bit in red. Well, that's a hole in our radio polygon. So um, we want uh, for our radio polygon is sort of defined if we've got a, we've got tri by triangles and edges uh, that we've got in our underlying graph. Um, and we've got a cycle that's just too big to cover by, by nodes in the middle. So that's not part of the radio polygon. Um, we overlay the radio polygon on a grid. Um, this isn't a scale. We've actually got a, the, the grid is quite a bit smaller than this, although it's, it's constant, uh, constant granularity grid. And then what we do is we fill in all the cells of this grid, which our radio polygon intersects. Um, you can see, I'm not sure how clearly it comes out of the projector, but there is um, the cell in the middle there, which isn't shaded, which is sort of uh, is represented by the fact that we have a hole. And we'll always have a gap in our, um, in our grid if we have a gap in our, in our, in our radio polygon. And then simply what we do is, well, we've got all these shaded cells of the cell polygon, and uh, we give each one a node, and we connect adjacent cells by an edge. So this is our grid graph. I said that, no, that this grid graph has a hole, which is right in the middle there. Um, so because this grid graph has a hole, we would not be able to perform our routing scheme on this grid graph. I was just sort of using it as a demonstrative example. Uh, we can, of course, compute the grid graph, though, and we believe it's potentially a useful abstraction um, in any case. Um, so we've got this grid graph formed by our cell polygon, but, well, we still need to compute this using actual nodes. So what we're going to do is we're going to assign representatives from V to simulate nodes in the grid graph. Um, so what we've got here is we've got uh, the nodes in blue are nodes in the original unit disk graph, and we've um, put them in charge of simulating some of our grid nodes. Now, um, it turns out we can compute this all in the local mode. It's all in the local mode, and it's all broadcasts as well, uh, which is why I say that we can, up to this point, we can do everything in broadcast congest because we only need broadcasts and the local modes to get where we are now. Uh, we have some very nice properties for all of these representatives as well. Okay, so we've got that um, if a node is in a cell, it is at most one hop away from the representative of that cell. Uh, we've got things like um, a node in V is only the representative for a constant number of nodes. Um, and very importantly, we also have that if two grid nodes are adjacent, their representatives are at most three hops away from each other. So in some sense, this is a very natural sort of sparsification or skeleton of the unit disk graph, um, which allows us to, to perform computation efficiently. And in fact, we even get a simulation result out of it. So we can say that the following holds. We can simulate one round of hybrid on the grid graph in a constant number of rounds of hybrid on G. Um, and this is because we've got all these um, We've got all these, so we've got constant responsibility for all of the representatives, so that none of them are too overloaded. And we've got a constant distance between adjacent grid nodes, so we're fine there. And also, because we've got um, a, 
constant number of hops between adjacent grid nodes. And we also have this result that uh, the representatives are very, very close to other nodes in the same cell. Um, we also have a result that if we've got a path in the grid graph between two representatives, uh, that induces a, a, a constant factor path in the original graph. Okay, so we're not still not solving the problem. We've just abstracted away our unit disk graph and we've got a grid graph now. Um, I'll be using a different example for the rest of this talk, because as I say, this one uh, has a hole in it. But if we don't have a hole, um, say we've got something like this, then this is how roughly we proceed. Um, now, so from now on, by the way, we're going to be um, using the global network, because now we need to do some aggregations um, across quite long distances, essentially. So, OK, so first step is we arrange the grid nodes into maximal vertical connected chains called portals. Um, and portals can be um, sort of height one. I, I don't have one that's height one in this example, but they, they can be height one. Um, so no edges. Um, we connect adjacent portals to each other at their lowest points and we root the resulting tree. Now, how can we root the resulting tree? This is already getting a bit difficult. We're already doing things that are non-local here. Well, we use a very useful technique that we're given uh, by the fact that we have a global network, which is called pointer jumping. So uh, once we have a tree, we get the Eulerian tour of the tree. And so we've got a big cycle. And then we cut that cycle at a point and we've got a long path, which includes all of the nodes several times, includes sort of M nodes, if you like. Um, and then what we do is the following. Every node introduces that its neighbors to each other. And so um, nodes know their, uh, the neighbors distance two from each other. Um, then nodes introduce their neighbors to their neighbors and so on and so on. So you, um, you know your nodes distance two away, distance four away, et cetera, et cetera. And after log n steps, uh, we have a graph with diameter log n, which allows us to perform some computations extremely useful. Um, and of course, we don't get this if we only use the local edges, and this is the big difference. So we can root the resulting tree and say we root it in the, in the bottom left. We then do, um, we use um, our Eulerian tour technique again and pointer jumping, and we can perform a depth first search sort of in parallel again. Uh, so we'll compute the pre-order number of all of our nodes in this tree. And again, this takes log n rounds. Pretty much all of these steps take log n rounds because we're, we're doing this pointer jumping technique. Okay, um, we then compute the maximum pre-order number in each subtree. And this serves to give us something very useful. So now we have a label for each node. Um, and the extremely useful property that this has is that a label uh, and labels are all intervals and um, a label is a sub interval of another label if the respective node is a child of that node. Um, so you can see we've got the root of the tree has the, the widest possible label. All of its children have sub labels, sub intervals of that label. Um, some of them are highlighted in red. I'll explain what that means. So each node is also made aware of the label of the node closest to the root within its own portal. So um, basically the, the head of the portal. Um, and we, we, we call that the portal label. And again, this is possible uh, in O of log n rounds by doing this pointer jumping technique along a long portal. So we can um, broadcast a message in log n rounds because we can produce a, a, a graph with diameter log n essentially. And the node labels and the portal labels together form the, the labels L used in this routing scheme. And uh, remember this is only log n information, right? I mean. Uh, the number of grid nodes is sort of um, big O of n, and obviously we've just got uh, three numbers essentially associated with that, so, or four numbers, sorry, associated with that. So this is log n information. Then we use this information for routing. Now, um, I'm a little short of time, so I'm not going to go into this routing algorithm in detail, but essentially what we do is we route horizontally while we know that um, we need to go to that portal. And if there's no next horizontal portal for us to go to, then we route vertically. And we can do this by looking at the intervals. So while we're routing horizontally, um, we look to see if the portal label of the portal that we're routing to is closer in some sense to the target portal label. And when we're ver routing vertically, we do something similar, but just with the node labels. I'm not going to go too much into it, but, but this labeling is enough information for us to decide whether to go left, right, up or down um, in the grid node sense at any given grid. Okay, so now we have a routing scheme in the grid graph. We 
recall that they said juice is shortest part in G. This is a nice property that we've proven. Um, so to route from a source node to a target node, we simply route from S to S's representative. We route from the representative of the cell containing S, the representative of the cell containing T. And remember, an edge between grid nodes implies a path at most three hops. So we have some constant, um, some constant factor times the worst case there. Um, and routing between the nodes and their representatives takes at most one hop. So we, we um, have had path of constant stretch. Uh, the routing scheme induces a path of constant stretch as a result of that. Okay, so that's our result. Um, there are a few open questions left um, naturally from our work. So one open question is obviously the general case of UDGs with internal holes. I said that we could do that, that grid graph earlier because it has an internal hole. Um, this is much harder, we think, because it's um, the paths are no longer constantly deformable from each other. We have to make decisions about which direction to route around obstacles, essentially. Um, and that requires significant global coordination. We think it's likely to be a factor in the running time. Um, we can come up with, uh, we can also think about generalizations to other planar graphs or other geometric graphs. Um, there are certainly more things we can do there. Perhaps computing some sort of natural skeleton would work there too. Um, and of course, a very natural question, which was asked about one of the other papers earlier, is generalization to graphs in higher dimensions. So we can have unit ball graphs with genus zero, for example, uh, and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll have to take questions. <laughs>